ladies and gentlemen, it's time. Enjoy the show. Well, I was a fanatic. There's no doubt a fanatic. My goal was to get carried out of the wrestling room because of exhaustion, and it never happened. The thing it did for me every day about 6 o'clock is that when I got out, I looked back in, and there was nobody else there. Bottom line was I didn't reach my goal. So guess what happened? I went back in the room again. But I got some quality time because of just some kind of a fanatic goal. Welcome back to Wrestling Change My Life podcast. Today's guest is Sean Borme, who's the head coach of the University of Michigan wrestling team. And before that, Sean owned and was the head coach of the Overtime School of Wrestling, which is a elite academy uh, for wrestlers in the Chicago area. So this guy knows a ton about motivating athletes, coaching athletes, and getting the most out of them. Really hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. And for past episodes, please visit and for past episodes, please visit wrestlingchangebylife.org or just use whatever app you're using on your phone right now. It doesn't matter. It's out there everywhere, all corners of the interwebs. So enjoy it, folks. Thanks again. And for past episodes, please visit wrestlingchangemylife.org. And if you're listening to this on your phone, please subscribe, give a rating, give a review on whatever platform you're on. It means the world to us and helps get the word out for this podcast and for our great sport. We are here with Coach Sean Borme. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, no, we're excited for the for the conversation here. I know, you know, we're catching you now in the off season. You're the head coach at, at University of Michigan. So before we get into your past and, and some of your you know, core philosophies and principles, maybe uh, give the listeners just an insight on what it's like you know, running a program in the off season versus the in season and, and what you guys are up to over there right now. Yeah, actually it's, it's interesting. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people and I get a lot of questions like about downtime and, you know, the season being over and, you know, actually I've found that, you know, this time of year is actually busier than the wrestling season. You know, our wrestling season is very structured from week to week. Um, but this time of year we're, you know, we're just, we're busy with the team guys are training you know, some guys are competing, you know, we have guys competing internationally, you know, recruiting's, uh, you know, kind of in high gear. So, you know, doing a lot of, a lot of visits on the road and, you know, bringing kids on campus still. So it's a, it's a busy time of year, um, focused on a lot of development with our, our, you know, our current team and, you know, with the way some of the, the U S world team trials process has grown, you know, that's expanded our, expanded our competition season uh, by several weeks. So we have, um, a final X that Adam Coons getting ready for next weekend. We have, um, four guys getting ready to compete in the European games over in Minsk, Belarus at the end of the month. And we have uh, about 11 guys getting ready to leave uh, next week to go to Belarus for a, a 10 day training camp, uh, with Sergey Belaglazov and, and Kellen Russell. So it's uh, it's a busy time. Wow. So you're focusing on the guys you have getting you know, getting their skill level up a couple levels. Um, you have some guys competing, and then the recruiting, I'm sure, is a massive task as well. How much of your day to day is focused on fundraising and kind of the business aspects of the program, if at all? You know, actually, a lot of it is focused on fundraising. You know, with the new model of you know the clubs and the RTCs and, and raising uh, dollars for our senior level program. Um, you know, fundraising is really you know, it's really gotten more involved and, and I find that it takes, you know, it takes a lot of time and, you know, we kind of, the last year we developed a new, a new fundraising campaign. We call the Wolverine gold medal fund. You know, we've kind of slowly been uh, launching that and we're at a point now where we have all the pieces in place and a pretty good system. So we're getting ready to expand, uh, you know, our efforts to, to push that campaign with our alumni and our fans and our, and our boosters. So, um, it's actually, it's quite a bit of time actually is working on that piece, uh, you know, especially this time of year. I can imagine I, I'm in software sales and I know just how hard it is to, to get a deal over the line. I can't imagine fundraising while you're doing all those other things. So it, it kind of gets to, to something I wanted to ask you is you seem like a pretty structured guy and that you have a, a, you know, a ton of discipline and you attack each day. 
are you planning out your your days, weeks, and months in ahead, or, or kind of what does that look like for you, and how do you structure your your off season program? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I keep a pretty good structure. Uh, I've been working on, you know, an overall annual plan here this first year. You know, I kind of had a good idea what we would be doing. You know, and there's a team aspect of it. You know, you have different buckets of stuff that you got to, you know, kind of put an annual plan together. And it's, you know, it's our team. You know, it's fundraising and our RTC, and that's got an annual plan that I've been working on. Um, you know, our alumni outreach and communication that has an annual plan, you know, and then there's just like the daily things, you know, that I've kind of identified, you know, monthly from a schedule, you know, in terms of stuff administratively and, you know, institutionally things that have to happen here in Michigan, you know, for compliance and you know, mm-hmm. eligibility and acad- academic markers. So it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a big piece cause you get the university team and then really running the club and the RTC, it's like a whole separate program. You know, and that's where the fundraising's really increased. I mean, we're we're pushing, you know, really trying to you know raise uh, about five hundred thousand a year for that. So, you know, this first year I've really spent a lot of time working on those annual plans. Um, you know, I'm constantly trying to shore them up, and you know, and now I got them in a place where you know we're sitting down as a staff and kind of looking at them together and you know dividing up uh, you know areas of responsibility and tasks. Yeah, it's like you're uh, the CEO of a business kind of, and you have all these different you know, kind of lines of business almost. And, and then you have the guys in your team and your coaches, and there's so many things going into it. Um, it it's just it's interesting to ask about. And now I'd love to spend a little bit of time going back early in your career. So you went to high school at Providence Catholic, um, state champion in Illinois. You know, maybe just give the listeners kind of what was your what was it like growing up for you and like how did you get introduced to the sport and and you know, when did you flip the switch to being the kind of extreme competitor that you are now what what was that journey like for you? Yeah, you know, I was I was fortunate. I started wrestling about fourth grade, and it's it's kind of funny. It's a it's a running joke here with some of my friends in Michigan, uh, especially some of my friends that played hockey here in Michigan. Um, I, I actually wanted to play hockey. I was in fourth grade and I, I brought a hockey flyer home to show my parents. And, you know, my dad was a, a union plumber. We lived in, you know, Frankfurt, Illinois. And, you know, my dad was looking at the flyer and, you know, I could hear him and my mom talking a little bit. And, you know, ice time was probably close to an hour away. And a lot of the ice time for this team I was going to try to play on was like 930 at night. You know, my dad was up at like 430 to go to work every day. And, you know, and I could just tell the conversation <laughs> didn't sound like it was going in the direction where I was going to play hockey. And literally the next day, uh, my dad had me uh, standing on a wrestling mat at a, at a club in Mokina, Illinois. And I started wrestling there. And then a year later, my dad started a club in Frankfurt, Illinois, with a group of dads. And, you know, I just, it was a great introduction to the sport for me because uh, I was smaller for my age and um, super competitive. Uh, so I, I kind of just locked in on how competitive the sport was and, you know, how, you know, at the age you know, of eight years old, I didn't realize it, but I, you know, looking back, I, I knew that you know, it was clear. I really enjoyed the individual aspects of the sport where you really were in control of your own destiny. Um, you know, and, but it was a great introduction because my, my dad uh, had a really good approach to how he, you know, coached our team and coached me specifically as his son. I had a lot of, you know, um, freedom within the sport to, to train the way, you know, it wasn't like he was standing over me yelling at me to train and do this and do that all the time. And he put a lot of pieces in place for me, but really got out of the way and just let me kind of grab, you know, grab things as I wanted to. And, you know, with my friends, we'd get together and do a lot of like wrestling in my basement. We had a map. My dad was never really down there, like, you know, telling me what to do or, or driving me. You know, he really let me kind of develop my own internal drive for the sport and, you know, how much I wanted to put into it. <clears throat> and I think that really paid off later, you know, later in my in my wrestling career. You know, in high school, I had, I had an opportunity to go to Providence Catholic and wrestle for, you know, Mike Poles and Tim Rudiger, you know, and we just had a, a tremendous group there. I had some unbelievable teammates and our camaraderie of the sport there was just it's really really special I mean to this day you know I'm very close with my former high school teammates 
and our coaches. I mean, to the point, you know, like we get together yearly. Um, you know, I probably, I probably talk to my high school coach, you know, you know, a couple times a month. I see him, you know, yearly. Wow. Um, so it was a really special group of people there at that time. And then, you know, obviously we had a good program. We worked hard. We had a lot of success. And, you know, that was really the catalyst for me to have the opportunities I did uh, to go wrestle at the University of Michigan in college. Yeah, you had a, an incredible college career, a you know, multiple-time All-American, uh, Big Ten champion, ended up losing to Pat Smith, and then went on to the international scene and, and wrestled for several years there before going into coaching. Um, you know, when, when I look at old videos of you wrestling, it's it's just the, you know, it sounds so cliche, but kind of the eye of the tiger, just this, like, thousand-mile stare, this unrelenting focus. Like, when did it switch for you when you went, all right, I'm doing this club with my dad to, I want to be a state champion, an NCAA champion. Like, when did that happen for you? You know, it really started, you know, each level I was at. I mean, I wanted to be a state champion every year. I wrestled in that um, you know, and it was just, you know, it was just so competitive and I, it was so personal to me when I wrestled. I mean, I always enjoyed it, but you know, it was just, a wrestling match felt very personal. I, ne- I did not want to lose uh, to the guy that was standing across from me. And, you know, it was just early on, it was just an early, you know, an instinct. I mean, it was just really, really competitive. And, you know, that was a big part of the reason I went to Providence. They had just tremendous coaching and a program there. And I wanted to be the, be- the very best I could be. And I wanted to have the best opportunity. And that was a tough decision, you know, uh, at that age, I was, you know, 14 and, you know, all the kids I grew up with and all my friends and my cousins, you know, they all went to the public school, which was Lincoln Way Central at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I made the choice to go a different direction and go to Providence. And, you know, it was you know, the best decision I made uh, in terms of the team, the teammates and the coaches I had and the school it was just a tremendous school to be at. Um, you know, and then I wanted to win state. I felt like I, you know, I fell short, you know, I, I, took third as a sophomore and third as a, a junior. And, you know, honestly, like I, I felt, I feel like I fell short of, you know, a lot of my goals in high school, um, not from a lack of effort or the work I was putting into the sport, but just really learning how to compete, you know, and, and, in some of the most critical moments, um, you know, in assembly hall, I mean, that's where you, you know, you really learn how to really compete <clears throat> when the spotlight's on. And, you know, I think that really helped me when I got to college. Yeah, and a lot of people might not know this, but you were kind of growing up at the same time as another Illinois legend, so to speak, Joey Gilbert, who was a four-time state champ. And your junior year, you guys were on a crash course to meet at the state finals. And, you know, in your semifinal match, I think you were up like by 14 points or something and ended up getting caught and ended up losing the match. So I know it's probably a tough thing to reflect on even now, but you know, do you remember, was it was it a lack of focus? Was it kind of just a fluke thing or like and, and then that but then also how did you kind of rebound from that it had to be an incredible uh incredible blow like how did you rebound from that going forward and, and use it as motivation yeah i mean at the time I, mean, I remember that match clearly and all the circumstances around that year's state tournament you know there was a lot of talk throughout the year about joey and i you know we grew up probably i don't know 10 15 minutes apart from each other you know, we wrestled each other in IKWF. You know, we wrestled that summer prior in freestyle. And there was just a lot of buildup about that match. And I was, you know, I was excited about it. And Joey and I were friends. You know, we, we spent times in the summer, you know, wrestling, obviously, on some of the national teams and stuff. So, you know, we were pretty competitive. But obviously, you know, it was a, you know, we had a good friendship, too. But, you know, that year, there was a lot, you know, a lot on the line for both of us. And, uh you know, really in that match, it was it was really just, you know, I kind of hesitated for a second on, on the out-of-bounds line. We were on our feet. I caught the guy to get my last takedown and tech him. And uh, I remember we were kind of out of going out of bounds, and, and I, I, I thought the ref tapped me on the shoulder because I kind of looked, and right when I looked, he threw a headlock uh, tight, and, and we hit the mat like right on the line, out-of-bounds, and I really didn't even know where I was at. I was pretty disoriented, and I bridged hard. And actually, when I bridged up, I drove us inbounds more. Um, you know, and I've obviously watched that on video a bunch of times back back then. 
that summer uh, it was quite a motivator for me. But it's it's one of those great lessons in in wrestling, you know, that really parallels everyday life. I mean, I had I had two choices at that point. I could, you know, let that thing pull me down, or I could let that match, you know, drive me to a higher level. And you know, I would sit up at night and watch it, you know, frequently that summer, and it really raised the level of everything I was doing in terms of my lifting, my drilling, my training over the summer with my, you know, my teammates. I mean, <clears throat> you know, so I, I just used it as a motivator and, you know, I, I took a lot away from that match because earlier in that match, I was, I was, you know, I was beating William Gay pretty handily and I had a couple opportunities where I took him down to his back and I had a couple opportunities to pin him. And, for whatever reason, I, I decided, you know, I just didn't really aggressively try to pin him because I was scoring points so easily. Uh, you know, I just went for the tech and, you know, that was really what drove me to a higher level to pin guys and was really a catalyst for me the next year to go, you know, and break all the state pinning records. And then even to, you know, be a big pinner in college uh, was that specific match. No kidding. So it's, it, you know, it's so interesting to think about it. And, and most people I talk to who have achieved a high level of success, they all have some type of obstacle like that, where at the time it seemed like the worst thing in the world, but looking back, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to your game. And so yeah, <laughs> clearly, clearly seems like the case with you, but you know, how many times do you think you watched that match that after that, that state tournament the following summer? Yeah, it was, I don't know, probably, probably a dozen times. I mean, I would, if I couldn't sleep late at night, I'd be up in the living room watching, you know, back then it was like VHS tape and, you know, I'd be in there with the the VCR and, you know, I, I can remember a few times my mom, like hearing me up and she'd come out there and she's like, you shouldn't be watching that match so much. And I'm like, oh, it's fine. It just, you know, it really motivates me. It makes me think a lot about a lot of things. I mean, that's the thing that from an early age, I realized about our sport is, you know, it, it forces you to constantly look in the mirror about you know what you want to do and what you're willing to do to get it and you know that was just part of what drove me back then i love that i'm getting getting excited just thinking about this now take us to a time it could be high school college or international in your mind when you were at your peak competitive state was it like your senior year of college when was that for you you know i think i had you know, peaks at each level. I mean, I definitely in college, you know, my, my junior, senior year, you know, I had a, a kind of a rough knee injury uh, right before the Big Tens my sophomore year, which knocked me out. I actually didn't get to compete at the Big Tens or NCAAs my, you know, my sophomore year. But, um, you know, my junior, senior year, you know, I really understood, you know, the, the, what it took to train and, and compete at a high level in college, you know. And, uh, you know, and then my, my – you know, my my senior year, junior summer and senior summer, I started going out to Foxcatcher uh, outside of Philadelphia. And at the mm-hmm. time, you know, there was just so many great wrestlers from the U.S. and some international guys, like, living there and training there. Some of the guys that I grew up kind of, you know, looking up to uh, in the sport. And I had an opportunity to spend quite a bit of time there with those guys training and just, just you know, kind of being a sponge and just, soaking up everything I could from that environment. And, you know, that really, I think really broadened my perspective on, on training and competing and, and, um, you know, and then I took that into, you know, right after college and at the senior level, you know, and 95, 96, uh, through 2000. And, you know, and those mm-hmm. were some of my, you know, some of my, you know, greatest memories of the sport were, was some of the time I spent out there training with those guys and learning. Yeah, I heard an interview one time where you had a, I don't know if it was a close relationship, but certainly a relationship with Dave Schultz. And we've had Nancy Schultz on the podcast before. Um, so maybe w- what, you know, looking back, what are a couple of things you took away from that experience at Foxcatcher and in particular with Dave Schultz? Yeah, I think with, you know, I really enjoyed Dave. You know, I obviously, you know, I started going out there in like 93, and, you know, and, um, you know, obviously he was, he was killed a few years later so you know but the years I spent out there I really you know he was a one of the reasons I wanted to get out there is you know because I technically I knew you know he was exceptional and you know and he was still competing at the same weight I was at and you know I just learned a lot about the sport from him technically and how to break down technique and think about it you know two three steps out um he was I think a real master at, at that kind of stuff like game planning and just putting 
putting together, you know, technique in a way where he was operating, you know, constantly like two, three moves ahead of a guy. And, you know, I kind of just, you know, wanted to work out with him as much as I could and learn from him. And, and it was interesting because at that point I was pretty, uh, you know, I was pretty guarded with my training, I would say to a degree. I mean, I'd wrestle with anybody and train with anybody, but in terms of technique and like sharing things, like I learned a lot from Dave because Dave was real open with, I mean, I was a guy at his weight, a young guy coming up at his weight, and he was always willing to help me and show me things. And, you know, if you beat me on stuff in that practice, you know, I'd ask him some questions about the positions. And, you know, he was always willing to help because, you know, at the end of the day, I learned a lot about just that approach. I mean, he was, you know, he wasn't insecure about anything he was doing. And, and you know, he knew the more he was helping others, the, the better he was getting himself. And, and he was just real, you know, real great guy like that. And uh, you know, I was super, you know, grateful I had the opportunity to know him when I did and, you know, I have a relationship with his family. You know, I still stay in touch with his, you know, with Nancy and his his son Xander to this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's clear to me that, that you love the process of learning and, and, and honing new skills versus just working out and lifting and running hard. I think there's, you know, over the past 15 years in wrestling, there's been a big focus and maybe this is because of some of the things that Penn State's doing, but it seems to be, you know, when I was growing up, it was more of a workout as hard as you can and just kind of grind it out versus skill acquisition. And it sounds like that's what you were going out there for back in the day was just really upping your game year after year versus just working out and wrestling hard. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a point in college where I learned how to, you know, I learned how to, you know, I was lifting hard and running hard. I learned how to grind and learn, you know, learn to, you know, the toughness, even in, in, uh, you know, I would say like growing up, I learned work ethic from my dad and then I learned how to be really tough from my high school coach. And, you know, and then in college I was able to apply a lot of that stuff early. And then I started really, you know, fortunately, you know, through, you know, Joe McFarlane when he came to Michigan and then, you know, spending time out of Foxcatcher, I really started to appreciate and dial into that whole, you know, skill and strategy part. Sure. Now, when you were at your, let's say your senior year, you're in the thick of it. You are in the in the groove. You're well on your way to, you know, accomplishing your goals. Help us understand what a, like a day in the life was like for you back then. Like, when were you getting up? What was your routine? Um, love to just kind of get a purview into that. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, obviously we had school. You know, Michigan's a great academic institution. So I was, you know, my senior year, I had a, I had a pretty full semester, first semester, but I I didn't need that many credits to finish second semester. So it was kind of nice. I think I only had like three credits in my second semester. So I could really focus on, you know, I'd usually, you know, we have like, you know, at least one or two conditioning, you know, workouts in the morning, you know, during the week. And, you know, I'd usually get, you know, extra drill in with one of my teammates. And a lot of times it was uh, Brian Harper was a weight below me. He was NCAA, NCAA finalist that year. Uh, lost a, a match to Lincoln McElravey, but he was a, you know, a great training partner that I could always count on. So we would do a lot of extra things together in some of those mornings. And then, you know, I'd take class and, and, you know, recover and eat and then, you know, sometimes watch some film and, and then I'd be back over, uh, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon, you know, every afternoon uh, to train and get some live wrestling in. And, you know, in some recovery, I would, I would sign up quite a bit for recovery back then. You know, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's one thing that, you know, some of our younger wrestlers growing up now, they, they, they don't really have the luxury with the, the NCAA rules to, you know, to learn how to sauna and, you know, just a camaraderie piece of signing, not for weight loss, but just for, you know, for recovery and, you know, and even just warming up your body before practices. You know, it was kind of a, a routine for my teammates and I. And um, it was, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie around that too. So, um, so that was kind of like what a normal day was, but I wouldn't always watch video, you know, for me, I, I'd watch some wrestling, but I wasn't, I didn't always just watch wrestling. Like even growing up in high school, I, you know, in high school and college and, you know, and beyond, I would, even back then I would watch video just, just to get, you know, some days get myself more motivated. You know, I think some days, yeah. you know, you got to find different sources of motivation. And, um, you know, back then I would watch, you know, clips and, training and, and interviews with, with Mike Tyson. And I would try to find and watch and read a lot of articles and interviews with Michael Jordan, just because of his mindset, you know, and some of the, you know, professional, you know, sports 
guys that were at, you know, the highest level of their sport, you know, and even, um, you know, I started following and reading some stuff about Freddie Roach when he was kind of in his prime as a, as a boxing coach. And, you know, so I would find other things that interested me, but they always came back to, you know, either learning or being some source of motivation. So I spent a lot of time doing that, even that, that senior year of college, um, you know, because I had some extra time on my hands with a light class load. Right. And that's what you're, you know, no doubt young wrestlers are going to be listening to this when they're on a morning run or when they're training, you get that source of motivation. Um, it's crazy how it can come from anywhere. And I think as former athletes, even in business, you know, if I'm going into a big meeting, I'll put on an interview with Michael Jordan just because, you know, sometimes you have those moments where maybe you're questioning your skills a little bit or a little bit of self-doubt creeps in and you hear something like that and it, and you switch right back on, you know, so it doesn't take much, but, um, I love that you did that. What about like visualization? Um, did you get into that at all? I mean, some guys we talked to, they had a pretty intense routine. Like Jake Herbert was pretty fanatical about it. Others tried to try to keep their mind quiet. How do you think about that kind of thing? Even with your guys now? Yeah, no, I, I encourage our guys to do it all the time. You know, mental reps, I tell them all the time in mean, visualization. I, I did it all the time. I didn't really do it so much when I was younger. Um, but I started doing a lot in college and I picked it up at a summer camp. We were, we had a big camp system here in Michigan and, and, um, there was a coach that, you know, we had some guest clinicians all the time and there was a, a guest coach one time that came through and he had the whole camp, you know, the mat I was working with him, the whole camp, all the campers were doing it. I just laid down and did it with him. And he kind of talked us through like 15 minutes of a, you know, a, you know, just kind of some visualization and, you know, I picked it up then and I started doing it often in college. You know, I, I share with our guys all the time. Like I would be on the, you know, the, the commuter bus around campus or walking the class and I would just be, you know, laser focused walking down the sidewalk, but my mind would be, you know, getting, you know, single leg reps and finishes, you know, seeing myself in certain positions, you know, how I was responding. I mean, I was constantly doing that stuff, uh, you know, throughout the day, you know, when I was on a bus or walking around campus or, you know, some, I tried not to do it too much when I was like going to sleep because it would get me keyed up sometimes and I'd have a hard time falling asleep. So I tried <laughs> to do it more, try to do it more during the day. And I actually would learn to really try to take my mind away from wrestling at night because it, it would, it would disrupt my sleep, you know, but I yeah. think it's super valuable, super valuable. Well, it's such a kind of, un, maybe not unknown anymore, but it wasn't a common thing even that long ago. You, you think about, People say what separates the winners from, you know, like the mid-pack is their mind. But you think about oh, an average high school team or maybe even a college team now, you know, 99% of their time is spent on the physical training versus the mental training. Um, and uh, it's just something I've gotten more into lately. And a lot of the people we've talked to have gotten more into is, you know, visualization because, you know, your mind can't tell if you're actually doing it or if you're just doing it in your mind. And so kind of having those mental reps, you know, it it's proven to be uh, extremely effective. So it's cool to hear you talk about doing that, like walking to class and, and even just on the bus, any chance you could get, you were just all consumed with it. Yeah. Especially new stuff, you know, I'd learn some new stuff or be working on, uh, you know, a new setup and I would just, man, I would just be consumed with it, you know, and I, and any kind of, you know, extra mental reps I could get on, I knew it was beneficial. I could talk about your career for, for, for a long time, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, and, and one of the things that was really so amazing about your career was how you transitioned into this, I don't know if you call it a wrestling businessman or just like, you know, just this movement you started with this club program. So for a lot of people who don't know, uh, Coach Borme was involved with the overtime school of wrestling in the early 2000s, which was the first kind of academy of its kind. Um, and maybe you can correct me on that, but you know now you know, these wrestling academies are everywhere, and it's a lot of you know full-time jobs for people to do this. It's a huge business. So, how did you get involved with the overtime school wrestling versus just kind of going down the path of coaching at colleges and and just maybe talk us through that experience? Yeah, it was an interesting kind of fork in the road for me. I um, I started thinking about that. I was still training and competing, but in 97, I, I tore my ACL and I was out for a while and I started doing a lot more recruiting while I, while I couldn't compete and train. Uh, I was at the University of Wisconsin at the time and I went out east to uh, a club. It was actually the first club, like a wrestling school of its kind. I, I would say I was probably more the second 
Um, and it was like 97. I went out to recruit uh, Donnie Pritzlaff. And he was training uh, at the Edge in New Jersey, which was run, opened and, and run by Ernie Monaco. And it was really unique. And I remember sitting there watching the practice and I was evaluating Donnie. And, and I just remember thinking like, man, this, this would really be awesome in the suburbs of Chicago. And I think it would take off and, and just be something great and something I would enjoy. But I had still planned to compete through 2000. So I just kind of, I kind of made some mental notes and, you know, when I got back from that trip, I just jotted some stuff down on paper and some of my immediate thoughts about it so I didn't forget them. And, um, you know, then a couple of years later and, you know, 99, 2000, I was kind of, you know, I made up my mind that after 2000, I was going to, I was going to stop competing. And, you know, and I, um, I started working on some plans to move back to Illinois and, and start the wrestling school. And at the time I had, I had met my wife and by, you know, training, she's a survey researcher. And, you know, we talked about some of my thoughts and she actually helped me put together a professional survey and we mailed it out to a lot of coaches around the Chicago uh, area. And, you know, they delivered this survey to their wrestlers and it helped me just really get a, a good idea of, of what would work and, you know, certain radius of, of where kids would come from and, you know, just a lot of the, the little things that were unknowns to me in terms of the planning, because, you know, if I was going to step away from coaching at Division One, I, I wanted to make sure I had a good plan of how I was going to attack it. And then that summer, I, you know, I, I connected with some, you know, some some of the coaches and families down in that area with some younger kids. You know, Don Reynolds was, uh, you know, was pretty instrumental early because he actually had his kids at the Michigan wrestling camp that summer that I was working. And, you know, and he was one of the, the early parents that kind of helped, uh, you know, helped when I got down in that area, spread the word. And, and then we had a lot of people from the Naperville area with like, you know, the Spangler family and Eric Tannenbaum. And, you know, it just kind of really started to get some, some critical mass early. Uh, Cause to be honest, like wrestling needed it, you know, I mean, there was so many motivated kids and families that wanted to wrestle and have like a really good training environment, environment outside the high school season but if you looked at each area, like there was only a few kids at each school that wanted to do that and put that kind of time and effort in, you know, throughout right. the entire off season. And, you know, so it started. And when I got back, you know, there were some, there was definitely some hurdles I had to get over. Like one of the big things early on was, you know, I think a lot of, there were a lot of coaches that felt maybe a little bit threatened that I was going to try to steal their kids, especially in the club model. Cause back then it was so competitive and, you know, and I think a lot of the, the younger kids, like junior high kids, I think their their coaches maybe thought I was going to try to steal their kids and form a club. And, you know, I had no intention to do that. I just wanted to be a, you know, a place where kids could come supplement their training and I could help them with technique and, and really teach them about the sport and share the things I knew. But I had no intention to, you know, make a an IQ to be a IQ team to be a club. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, at the high school level, I think, you know, some coaches – you know, I think they had some different feelings about the fact that we were charging and, and you know, and making money and creating a business out of it because, you know, they had, they had done it a lot over the years and put a lot of time in to the sport, um, you know, in a way where they weren't charging. But they were also, you know, I, I you know, for me, I always looked at as well, you, you know, you're getting paid as a teacher. And, you know, you do wrestling because you love it and you coach and you get like a little bit of extra money to coach. But, you know, you love the sport. I love the sport, too, but I want to do it full time. You know, it'd be like teaching and you know, being a math teacher, and not getting paid to be a math teacher. Like you couldn't be a math teacher then, you know. Um, so there were some early some early hurdles I had to get over um, just with the perception of what I was doing and why I was doing it the way I was doing it. But, you know, once I kind of got through that, it started to really grow and you know, I think it started to unite and pull together the state a little bit because when I first opened overtime, there was still a big divide in the state between, you know, the, the IWF and IKWF and and even like the participation of Freestyle Greco and the USA numbers were really down. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, I, I always enjoyed the, the wrestling and the kids and the training and uh, all that, but I also, one of the things I felt really good about is by the, you know, in 2011, by the time I went back to Michigan, I mean, I had like created basically, you know, five full-time jobs in the sport of wrestling that didn't exist before. 
And right. I think that's what we see now is we see there's just a lot more opportunity for really good guys to stay in the sport and, and make a living, which allows them to stay in the sport. And it's, it's good for wrestling. You know, it, it definitely is. And they're, you know, Illinois, I'm partial. Yeah. I, huge fan of Illinois. Um, and, and you look at the, the results at the junior nationals, yeah, Illinois has won, I mean, God knows how many uh, national titles in a row. And, you know, I think at one point, like the junior duels team was all overtime guys. That was how, how many quality guys you had. So it was really just team overtime versus all these other states. And you guys were, were dominating. Um, you know, some of the guys at my, my time that were on that team was like the yeah, Edwin Cooper, Clamara. And, you know, it's just unbelievable the quality of guys you had, but, but obviously they were coming for a reason. It's because of how structured the, the program was and how serious you took it and, and the coaches you brought in. Um, you know, outside of the wrestling piece, were there any you know, business challenges that you learned about or, or overcome that you kind of take to your to your program now at Michigan? Yeah, I mean, I, I learned so much. Uh, I learned so much over the 12 years that I, I built and ran over time. I mean, and I didn't, I learned it all on the fly. I mean, I, you know, uh, there was so much to learn. And it, I, I feel like it really helped me evolve as a wrestling coach. And with the opportunity I had to come back and now be a head coach at Michigan. I mean, there were so many things I learned, you know, running that business that I wouldn't have learned if I just stayed in college coaching. I mean, I right. had to learn everything about building the program, you know, um, communicating a vision, you know, customer service, advertising, marketing, promoting, you know, and then working with a lot of different kids and a lot of different age groups. Uh, at the, at the, you know, at the grassroots level and understanding that whole system and process to, you know, to even the parents, you know, really understanding the makeup of the parents and how it impacts the kids. And, you know, that helps me a lot today with recruiting, um, you know, but there was so much I learned and that was a big part of it too. I, I mean, I think at heart, I have, you know, an entrepreneurial spirit and I really enjoyed, you know, all the different aspects of business I learned. I mean, there was times in those first, you know, three, four years, I mean, I would constantly be, you know, getting books at Borders or just going there and reading about these different aspects of business that I really didn't know. I didn't know a lot about, you know, so I had to kind of teach myself on the fly, even accounting. I was just constantly like, you know, yeah, <laughs> reading about like. accounting and trying to figure out how to run it all and, and keep track of everything and, you know, forecast and predict and you know, value time and, and what you're paying. And, you know, so there was, there was this a, a tremendous amount that I really enjoyed learning about. I really, you know, I do feel like it has helped me so much transition and be a much better, you know, college coach and head coach uh, than if I wouldn't have ran that business for 12 years. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, you, you had you had such a following of kids, but to your point, you know, a lot of, a lot of college coaches now go right from, uh, you know, college wrestling to international wrestling to coaching and they don't get that experience. And, you know, with the importance of fundraising, I must imagine you have, you have such a leg up. And also with recruiting, I mean, you were working with kids who who had some extremely overzealous parents. So even in like the middle school ranks, I don't, I don't think people realize how competitive Illinois is in the uh, middle school circuit, maybe even to a detriment sometimes with the, with some of the, the pressure these kids feel. So you had a experience of that at a young age. And I can just imagine how much that helps you work with the kids now at Michigan. Um because, you know, they were coming up through that millennial age, so to speak. I know people like to talk about how different the millennials are, but shit, you've been working with them since the early 2000s, you know, at a young age. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. No, there was a lot. I learned a lot. It was uh, some some really valuable years and, and some great memories uh, running the club. So I know we have about five minutes left with you here. I do want to hit on um, uh, your experience at Michigan. So. I mean, it had to be a dream of yours from a young age to, to maybe coach at Michigan. So maybe just help us understand, you know, if, if you had, if someone asked you, you know, a young recruit asked you, hey, coach, what's your, what's your philosophy on, on leadership? What's your philosophy on competition? I mean, do you have a couple, couple things that stick out to you? Or, or what are you looking for in these young athletes as you recruit them? I'd love to just hit on kind of your leadership philosophy a little bit before we sign off here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, leadership's, you know, it's kind of interesting because it's, you know, it's really about, you know, I've, I, you know, as I've learned more about what it means to me as I've moved up in different positions, I mean, you know, it's, it's really about, you know, unlocking and empowering, you know, people to reach their, their ultimate potential. And, you know, it's really about influence and 
you know, and the higher up you get in leadership, it really becomes about others, you know, and less about yourself in any capacity. And, you know, when I was an athlete, everything was just, you know, about me and, and you know, my teammates. And, you know, and then when I was an assistant coach, it was, you know, it was a lot about the guys. And now, you know, as a head coach, it's, it's about the staff, you know, it's about the athletes, it's about Michigan. I mean, it's, it's really about everyone else. And, uh, Nice. You know, so every and every guy's, you know, every guy on your team is wired a little differently. So it's really about, you know, being able to to understand and connect with many different types of personalities and learn how to unlock and, you know, get the most out of every single guy. And, you know, and create an environment where they are striving to be leaders, you know, within their own circle of influence. And, you know, when you have a team of, you know, let's say 34 guys and, you know, I talk about all the time, we might have, you know, might have two or three captains, but I need 34 leaders on the team. And, you know, so we talk about those things and, you know, but it's, it's this first year, it's been, you know, it's been, a, it's been a great adjustment. I, I got a tremendous staff here and, you know, but even as a leader now, like I, I look at how can I help the coaching staff reach their ultimate potential. So, you know, for me, it's really, it's become about, you know, really everybody, everybody else first so you kind of have three groups of, of cohorts right you have your assistant coaches which you know, i'm sure you want them to go on and be head coaches and then you have your current wrestlers and then you have your club wrestlers which sometimes those are guys who didn't even wrestle for you in college you're really looking after three different groups and helping them get the most out of out of their time with you i'd imagine yeah you know absolutely you know and then it's also you know it's you know it's your alumni i mean we're you sure. know we're uh, we're approaching some you know, some pretty special milestones for our program. I've been, you know, I've been really starting to think about a lot. I mean, we have our, I'll be, you know, I'll be here coaching, uh, you know, when we reach our hundredth year anniversary as a wrestling program, which is pretty special. And so I'm starting to put some thought into that and connect with our alumni base and, you know, really make that, uh, you know, a special, a special, uh, you know, point in time for our program. And, you know, the NCAs are going to be here in Detroit in 2022. So, you know, oh, there's nice. some special things, yeah, some special things, uh, you know, coming down the pipe. But even that, you know, it's like already thinking about it and starting to create a vision for the program, you know, for those those special marks. And uh, but it's, you know, it's it's fun. It's you know, it's what gets you up and you know, gets your uh, hair on fire as soon as the alarm goes off every morning. As you're thinking about <laughs> exactly. All these things, you know. I mean, it's it's the great part of our sport. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it sounds incredibly exciting. And you're someone who has a, you know, a passion for life. Um, kind of last thing before we move into three quick rapid fires is if you ever wake up and you're not feeling it, you know, you're just kind of down yourself for whatever reason, maybe you're tired or, you know, what do you, what do you tell yourself, right? What do you think about to, to kind of kick yourself in the butt and get going? Cause I know that's, you know, a lot of people can, when they're feeling good, they can do it and get up at 5 a.m. and work out. But if they're not feeling it, you know, how to, what do you do to, to kind of get moving if you're not feeling it, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, fortunately I don't have too many of those days, you know, I'm, I'm pretty motivated and I, I, I just, I love Michigan. I love coaching wrestling at the university of Michigan, you know, so I feel a great, great sense of responsibility for the things I'm in charge of. And, you know, and I, I think about all of our alumni and some of the alums I'm very close with and the, the legacy families we have here at the university, you know, and I think about our student athletes. So, you know, if I'm ever feeling, uh, you know, a lack of motivation, all I got to do is think about those things and it instantly energizes me and fires me up to, to attack the day and, and do everything I can to, to improve the things that I need to work on, you know, and, yep. you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, every day there's, there's new challenges and new hurdles, you know, but it's, you know, there's, there's, you know, and there's days like, you know, where, you, you know, you got some negative thoughts. It's like anything else, you know, there's, there's, that's why wrestling parallels daily life so much. I mean, there's, there's days I have some negative thoughts or I'm frustrated with something and, you know, I got, you know, I got a good awareness, catch myself and, you know, redirect those thoughts to, to, you know, problem solving and, and positivity. And, you know, that's the same thing I expect out of our guys. So I got to, I got to hold myself to the, to the highest standard with those things. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, as we sign off here, I always, I always wrap up with three quick questions. So we can call them rapid fire, but we don't feel like you have to limit it to just one answer, but um, any books that you've read in the past 
five years or any, like maybe what's the most gifted book you, you recommend to your guys that it's had a big impact on you? You know, I, I read a lot of articles and, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I read like Harvard business review. I read, okay. you know, so I find, I find a lot of different articles, you know, occasionally I'll just, I'll read books. I'm not really like a, a fiction guy. I read more, you know, factual like type books and, and, um, uh, and, um, one sec, sorry. Uh, there's a, and there's, uh, you know, some of those, some of those articles I find really interesting because they talk a lot about things I need to do here and, you know, management and business and leadership and, you know, an organization. So I'd say in the last like four or five years, I've been reading a lot of things like that, but I, I've read okay. some good motivational books, you know, and, and early on, you know, there's books I, I read, like there's, there's a book that was uh, a lot about, um, you know, Jordan, it was called competitive fire. I enjoyed, um, you know, I read a, a couple of um, Phil Jackson's books you know, about yep. coaching. I read some, some Bill Walsh books about coaching you know, I've been reading a lot of books about, you know, that are more in line with the work I do now. You know, as, a, as an athlete, I probably read more books that were related to training and fitness and, and sports psychology. Um, you know, but it's, you know, it's kind of all over the place for me. Have you read John Wooden's book, The Blue Book, it's called? No, I haven't. Oh, I uh, haven't. I'll send you a copy. It's, it's the book that, um, you know, Pete Carroll talks about it when, before he got to USC, he was fired by the Patriots and he had bumped, kind of bounced around the league for about 30 years. And he took a year off to, to kind of understand, you know, what is his philosophy? Because, you know, if someone asked him when he was coaching the Patriots, you know, what are you staying for? Like, what are your core tenants? He really didn't have a good answer for them. And, you know, if he doesn't know them, how can his guys know them? Right. And so during this year off, when he was kind of finding himself, he, he read this, it's called the blue book. It's really small by John Wooden. Um, and it's just, it's just unbelievable. It's all about leadership and coaching. And then after that, you know, Coach Carroll kind of developed his philosophy. And it takes a long time to do that because um, it's like you should be able to describe what you're about in one to two sentences. And, and his philosophy was always compete. And he's taken that now to the, to the Seahawks. And we have a, we've had his sports psychologist on a number of times, and they kind of do that together. But I'll send it to you because I think you would enjoy it. And it kind of gets to – you're the heart of what you're doing now. It's a great book though. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. It sounds great. You know, the, probably the last book I read that was entertaining and uh, interesting. Uh, actually a, a good friend of mine gave it to me uh, not too long ago. And I, I blew through it pretty quick was, it was a, it's pretty funny too, but a book called living with a seal. I don't know if you've read that with David Goggins. Yeah. Guys an animal. Yeah. Well, I think Chesley Itzler wrote it, but yeah, it's a, it's a great book. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty um, humorous too. I mean, I really, I really got it. I was cracking up at different points in that book. David Goggins is an absolute animal. He's kind of blown up a little bit now on the on the podcast circuit, but the guy's un, unreal. Um, yeah. Well, coach, you've been really generous with your time. The last question we always ask everybody is, you know, in a few sentences, how has wrestling changed your life, and and maybe why would you recommend it to uh, to a young boy or girl out there who's looking for something to get involved with? I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of, you know, like self-reflection, resilience, you know, being courageous, you know, leadership, you know, it's absolutely, you know, had the greatest impact in those, in those very important areas of my life. And I think it parallels, it just parallels daily life, you know, um, you know, so those are the, those are the things I always think about, and those are the things I always try to pass on to, you know, to the guys I coach. Well said, and it's you know the self reflection and and the persistence or resiliency. Those are themes that come up all the time, and you know obviously are super important for for life after sports. Um, well, coach, really appreciate your time. Uh, we'll edit this and get this out, and you just you know, thank you again. I really enjoyed the talk today. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. That's the end of this episode, but definitely not the end of the show. For more episodes, please go to wrestlingchangemylife.org. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a star rating. Show the love, baby. Show the love. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Peace.